great expectations. American elections held today mean either a president, Hillary Clinton, or Donald Trump at the White House. A likely prediction by November 4 this year when the nation of nations decides. Wherever you are, welcome to Globe Watch on this third day of 2016. I'm Charles Obuni, your anchor. Finish the job, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon urged delegates as they rose on their feet, applauding the struck gavel announcing the Paris Climate Change Deal. It was a unique opportunity for the entire world to decide on the future of the planet we want. So did we really come to an agreement that will save the planet, the only planet we have? My guest today comes from the United Nations Environment Agency, the voice of the environment within the UN family, headquartered in Nairobi, Kenya. <music> Dr. Richard Munan, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you very much for having me, Charles. Let us start with a quotation from you and from the president of the World Bank. And he says, this is extraordinary. It's a game changer. I feel better about my children's future than I did. Uh, Jim Young Kim, were you among those who applauded the Paris Climate Change Pact? Well, I think the Paris Climate Change Pact is our accord, is your accord, is my accord, is the seven billion citizens in the world's accord. This is unprecedented in not only from the perspective that the world came together to agree to curtail the changing climate, which was really having serious impacts, especially across least developing countries and in Africa in particular. So having agreed for the first time in the history of climate diplomacy and negotiations to reduce temperatures and keep them below two degrees and even reach the ambitious 1.5 degrees that have been negotiated over 22 years today is not just a big win for others, but it's a big win for every citizen in the world. So uh, indeed, I agree, not only to, with to the to president the, of the we'll World Bank. We'll get into the nitty gritties <laughs> for, for a moment. Nicholas Stern, the UK's former government advisor and leading economist, um, uh, praised the talks saying it is bringing a great opponent's expert diplomacy and mutual respect for, for all what you were saying. Was the deal really something substantial for the planet? Well, I think that the, the debate about whether the deal was substantial for the planet is going to continue, which is good because science, there's no, nothing like exact science, but science paved the way towards addressing particular issues, whether it's medicine, that discoveries are made to address particular diseases, just as in climate change where the creation of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was actually to try to assess the state of the world and the state of the planet in terms of where we headed if we continue along the pathway of increasing greenhouse gas emissions, burning coal and fossil fuel, which is dirty for the planet. What actually was contained in the accord? Well, the accord had different elements. The first element was that the world, for the first time, is going to work towards ensuring that the two degrees Celsius mark, which scientists have unequivocally stated that if we go above that, then we are going to have cataclysmic events. We're going to have droughts. We're going to have sea level rise that is going to disrupt not only life but inflict pain, especially in the African country and other least developing countries in the world. So the agreement brought together 196 countries to say, okay, we're going to do everything in our part to ensure that we keep temperatures below two degrees and even towards the ambitious 1.5 degrees. That was one. The second was that before COP21 in Paris, all countries across the world submitted what was called INDCs, which is Intended National Determined Contributions. And what this means is that every nation submitted a plan on how they were going to move towards a low carbon pathway, not to increase emissions. Mm -hmm. And these plans, um, um, to decarbonize their countries? Absolutely. These plans, 80% of African countries submitted this. And almost about 90% across the world submitted this. So these plans are actually going to present the pathway towards ensuring that the world doesn't hit two degrees and then unavoidable dangerous climate change could now then be cut off. But to ensure that there is 
continuous review, the agreement came out with a paragraph which stated that every five years there's going to be a review of whether the world is on a pathway to ensure that they don't reach the two degrees. Mm. And then the third was finance, which has been a very contentious issue for the past 21 years mm. uh, in the negotiation process. Mm. And there was the reiteration of what was called the Cancun Agreement in 2012, where developed countries pledged to give 100 billion to support least developing countries. Cancun, the conference which was held in Mexico. Absolutely, in 2012. So there was a reiteration of that uh, Cancun $100 Agreement. $100 billion dollar, um, US, uh, dollars. US dollars assistance to countries, especially in the developing world, to sustain um, uh, their climate change commitments. Um, you know, um, we all said that, okay, when we were going to Paris, um, we needed a legally binding document. But we fell short of that. Well, I don't think we fell short of that because in, in, in multilateralism, bringing almost about 200 countries to agree on a common vision is never easy. If you look at the World Trade Organization and the trade agreements, even up till today, the negotiations are still going on. But the climate diplomacy, for the first time, for all the countries to agree, there are going to be some compromises. And in this case, the, 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 the most important aspect, which I think that every citizen on Earth should celebrate, was that for the first time the world have a climate change policy. Sure, but you know, we all agree that for this to be effective globally, we needed a globally legally binding document. But you know about decarbonization, but we did not come to this. It was a failure. I don't think it was a failure. And the reasons for this are as follows. One, the agreement is legally binding in that every country agree to ensure that the two degree mark which scientists have said if the world was to pass that then we are going to have catastrophic events like droughts and like floods that would displace a lot of people and especially in the african continent where the u.n environment program and collaboration with partners came out with a report called the second africa adaptation gap report which unequivocally showed if africa if the world was to reach two degrees africa would need about 50 billion u.s dollars to be able to build a climate resilience and decarbonize the pathway towards uh, the, the development pathway but if we, the world is to keep temperatures below that, then the continent will not need that amount of money. However, on the part whereby there was voluntary agreement that the world should be able to ensure that they, they, they present every five years the plans which they submitted before COP21 in Paris called the Intended National Determined Contributions. Mm -hmm. This is voluntary, but however, <clears throat> the agreement presents an opportunity to provide incentives for investment. Because for the first time, this agreement, though global, have to be domesticated to national policies. There needs to be legislation in different countries ensuring that they can now pave a way towards incentivizing the private sector to invest in renewable let, energy. Let me just give you a quotation <coughs> of some of those people who were bitter about the Paris uh, Peace Agre um, Agreement on Climate Change. Nick Darden, director of campaign group Global <coughs> Justice, said it's Australians that the deal that is on the table is being spun as a success when it undermines the rights of the world's most vulnerable communities and has almost nothing binding to ensure a safe and livable climate for future generations. Because the idea was that the issue of decarbonizing the world, which is the core to maintaining global temperatures below 1.5, which was agreed is that it should be a legally binding issue. But you know what? South Africa, China, Japan, Russia, the U.S. said, but you see, when we do this, our economies are not going to grow. So that important aspect was left off the table. Were you disappointed? Charles, as I've said, for the first time, the agreement on climate change was fostered. Are there some elements that have to be continuously looked into in the coming years of course there are, but do we have a pack, a framework that the whole world could then look into and say, it is not a one size fit all, but we have a framework that we can be able to bring every country on board. Uh, how how, how do you see the board. implementation of this, um, of this global deal which was held? French president said that I'm very happy. Barack Obama says that for the very first time the world could show that it could come together. How are we going to implement this, you know that the coke of American politics, the Republican Party, which is 
controlling the U.S. Congress may find difficulties um, a, a, a passing this legislation. Is it possible? How do you see the implementation process? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Charles. I think the implementation part is actually what we call the elephant in the room. Because if you, let, me, let me put it in perspective of the African continent. If you look at the continent today, the, the, it is not the absence of good policies or the absence of innovational ideas. What has been actually glaring in front of everyone's eyes is that the implementation of most of the excellent decisions, not only the climate deal decision, mm -hmm. have actually uh, uh, not been done in a way that citizens could feel the impact. So the question of how will these agreement be implemented is quite very vital. And I think these are the different ways in which the agreement will be implemented. First of all, every country sign up to this. And that is why it is a universal agreement. And there are some elements that will continuously be looked into. Of course, like any other document, there is always a need to review. And that is why in the agreement, it is stated very clearly that every five years, this will be reviewed. Mm -hmm. But domesticating these in, at the national level, every country will have to domesticate this within the national law. There will have to be legislation being passed to ensure that uh, fossil fuels and greenhouse gases are actually not uh, uh, being done in a way like they used to be done before because there will be disincentives. And then there will be more incentives given to ensure investment in renewable energy, investment in solar, in wind, in geothermal, mm -hmm. so that the private sector and other sectors can start investing in it. But I think broadly, within this agreement, if you look at the African continent today, the continent depends on climate sensitive tech sectors. You have agriculture, which constitutes about 32% uh, percent or above of the entire continental GDP. And you have the energy sector, where as we speak today, 621 million Africans go ha are energy impoverished. Mm -hmm. And you have infrastructure, where as a result of sea level rise, report after report, especially the second Africa Adaptation Gap report, which was led by the UN Environment Program, shows that the continent of Africa will witness sea level rise 14 times higher than the global, I mean, uh, the global average. So if you put all these things in perspective, and now we have a framework which every country is accountable to report on, then it is therefore very, very important that within this framework, the enabling environment, which will come through legislation as well as different uh, laws that will be passed mm -hmm. to incentivize that environment to invest in. And I think now it's time also for African countries and the entire world to say, okay, if the continent of Africa has been actually uh, uh, not only termed as a continent that was rising, but how do we then rise in a way that it's environmentally friendly in a way that we're not destroying our ecosystems or water are forests. talking of environmental friendliness and I just told you that uh, opponents of the of the deal um, have all reasons to justify themselves because events just after COP21 in Paris, France, few days after proof give them reason. Um, a French sh chef hired to cook for world leaders. There were five chefs during that Paris uh, 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 conference. You know, one of the, the, the chef, just after the, 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 the agreement, went back to his um, land, and you know what? He raised 7,000 7, square kilometers of land, completely burnt it and destroyed it. And you know, his name is Mark Verat, and he was fined some uh, euros for doing that. This is just to say that even those who sat there discussing cooking and preparing that this deal, should work say that you know it was an environmental fast in France. Well, I I I I I don't think that to go into to to look at some of the things that might have happened that were not environmentally friendly uh, uh, from the perspective of overshadowing the 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 positive of what this agreement presents. The story I'm telling you is, is after COP21 agreement. Yes, what, 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 what I if think needs to be looked into. If those who sat inside there saying that we should agree on this are the first people to breach, there is no hope. Well, there is hope because if a single, I, I, would, I wouldn't say a single individual represents the 7 billion citizens of the world. And in this case, the 2 billion, the 1 billion African citizens uh, 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 are projected to reach 2 billion. I think let's look at it from the perspective of African continent today because mm. Africa is the most vulnerable country when it comes to climate change. Mm. Continent. Yes, the most vulnerable continent. Thank you very much for that. And as a result of this, we currently 
having the continent facing enormous challenges, not only youth unemployment at 60% today, but at the same time, even the workforce, that the, the youth population that is entering the workforce every year is 10 billion and projected to reach uh, 200 billion in less than 15 years as we speak. So within the changing climate, and we're already feeling the impact, the droughts in the Horn of Africa mm -hmm. and the droughts in the Sahel, all mm -hmm. these present the, the clear reality of climate change. There's no longer an abstract issue. Mm -hmm. So with this deal, how can the continent move towards a pathway that it's not only building resilience of communities and at the same time also helping us decarbonize our development pathway, mm -hmm. but help create jobs? Mm -hmm. And I think this question is actually what I think we need to answer. And, and, and the answers are in this deal. As I said, it may not be a perfect deal. However, there is a deal. And we must also focus on the opportunities that this deal presents. Mm -hmm. And one of the opportunities is adaptation. Mm -hmm. The continent of Africa today, before the COP21, made in uh, Cairo and came out with what was called the Cairo Declaration under the banner of the African Ministerial Conference for Environment. Mm -hmm. And their African position towards COP21 was there must be parity between mitigation and adaptation. Mm -hmm. And this in the deal was captured. There was also the point on this agreement that commitment mm -hmm. and pledges to ensure that the 100 billion, which was mm -hmm. uh, uh, accepted by the developed countries mm -hmm. to give to support least developing countries, especially in Africa, should mm -hmm. be given. Okay. This is in this deal. You, you, you see, um, um, let's speak one element which is of interest to many people, uh, and that is where the debate is probably the highest, the issue of energy consumption, uh, especially, especially carbon. Um, why many uh, energy giants across the world, in, including British Petroleum, BP, are investing so much in renewable energy, where their investment then is about 85 <coughs> percent. That is an enormous progress from the British perspective. But you know, when you go to the U.S., you have companies like Koch Brothers, which are going to spend 900 million this year on American elections. And as we know, Exxon Mobil scandal reminds us on a daily basis that there is every reason to think that this industry will, lead, will lie at every turn in an effort to hold on to their power. They are clearly willing to break the planet if it means five or perhaps ten more years of business as we do it as usual. I'm quoting Bill McKibben of The Guardian, writing in the British The Guardian. You see, there are severe challenges in front. Absolutely, there are severe challenges in front. But the message was very clear. The fossil fuel industry is a thing of the past. There will be no power Are you sure? Because there will be no power Are you sure? Because the agreement mandates and commit every country that signed up to it to pass legislation to disincentivize the fossil fuel industry. And once those legislations will be passed, the fossil fuel industry will not still have the power that they have today because the incentives and the enabling environment won't be there anymore. Renewable is what is going to be the feature of the planet. No. The challenges are there. And that is why I said the continuous review of this agreement, taking into consideration the barriers, the challenges, and also the emerging opportunity that comes as a result of its implementation mm -hmm. is vital. But this was also agreed by every country in Paris that every five years there need to be this review. And of course, the challenge that you've actually mentioned, that's reality. But is it a thing, something that will have to go away today? Absolutely not. But is it something that has to be worked and looked into very carefully so that there could be ways to move forward? Of course, yes. And that is why domesticating this within legislation. And I go back to your question of, will the United States sign up to this bill? The United States endorsed the agreement and worked so hard, as uh, the, the, the President of the United States indicated in the statement that you just you know, executive read executive powers in the U.S. is not legislative powers. But the United States signing up to this knew fully well that if this was not something they believe could pass through the House of Congress, uh, whether it's the uh, uh, Congress or the Senate, they wouldn't have signed up to it. So by signing up to this is an indication and sends a very clear signal to investors that the United States, not only the United States, China, India, these are countries that are actually are contributing to the emissions. Let and let by signing up to this sends a signal that greenhouse gas emissions, especially through dirty energy, in this case fossil fuels and coal, is a thing of the past. And together, the world can now say we are moving in the right direction within this framework. Let's rewind. Um, 
French President Francois Hollande said, never will I be able to express more gratitude to a conference. You can be proud to stand before your children and great grandchildren. Let's rewind a bit. Just paint a picture of the pre-conference atmosphere that favored this ambitious agreement. Before COP21 in Paris, the, there were a lot of reports that were released, and one of these was released by the UN Environment Program uh, uh, in collaboration with partners, and this was called the Emission Gap Report. That report unequivocally stated that where the world is today and where it's projected to reach, the world was able to hit about 3.7 to 4 degrees. And this was going to be catastrophic, not only for the least developing countries that are suffering the shocks, but even for the developed countries. Well, climate change has no passport. Climate change respect no barriers, and climate change. The smoke in China. Yes, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't respect barriers, and definitely, every developed or least developing countries will suffer the same impact. Mm -hmm. The floods that hit the UK, the United Kingdom, just a couple of weeks back, shows this that if everyone is prone and not immune to climate change impacts, and I think the world also seeing the economic crisis that hit. Uh, all the entire world in 2008 shows that a crisis like that could be also exacerbated by the changing climate because the fundamentals of good financial systems are also climate sensitive. All this put in, 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 in to, to, together, I think, accelerated the momentum. And let's also give credit to the host country that hosted COP21, uh, France. I think that they deploy not only the diplomacy in terms of getting countries to be able to be part of this pack that is signed up, but also working around the clock to ensure that the world was not going to be disappointed as they were in 2009 in Copenhagen because they, 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 they didn't sign up to the deal then. How will a community in Kenya, a community in Cameroon, a community in Nigeria, a community in Sierra Leone, a community in Ivory Coast, a community in Zambia, a community in South Africa benefit from this? And I think this, these are the three ways in which these communities could benefit. First of all, the glaring gap between policy and action is visible. And what I've stifled this for 54 years in the African continent today has been that partnerships have not been fostered in ways they're supposed to be, to, be, to be done. And this presents an opportunity to foster partnerships, not only partnerships to implement this agreement, but partnerships to implement the agreement in such a way that we could create an enabling environment for job creation for the so many youths across the African continent today who are at 60% percent unemployed. Second point. The second point is, in, in collaboration with the African Union Commission, the UN Environment Program across, uh, brought 1,200 uh, uh, citizens from all 54 African countries in July and came up with what is called the Ecosystem-Based Adaptation for Food Security Assembly. What does this entail? It is an implementation policy framework and also an implementation platform that brings policymakers, private sector, civil society organizations, uh, NGOs, uh, individual citizens, researchers and academia to be able to look at the agro value chain which is uh, at the moment being estimated to be a, an industry of one trillion US dollars in less than 15 years from today. Mm -hmm. How do we then bring everyone on board to tap and expand this agro value chain, especially utilizing approaches that are not destroying our environment but working with nature okay. to, to, to take this forward. Okay. And the I third point mm -hmm. is partnerships are actually not only presenting the opportunities to take Africa forward, but partnerships could help implement decisions, including the climate accord, and take Africa forward in ways that jobs could be created. And overarchingly, the 21st century is actually Africa's century, but this okay. is not preordained. Okay. However, the, 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 the declarations of good intent provide only an opportunity to move forward, but every citizen counts in making sure that these policies are implemented. And so utilize every opportunity, wherever you are, to talk how you could be able to do your own part in terms of implementing this agreement, as well as tapping into a sector that could be able to create not only jobs, but at the same time, generate opportunities for the 60% of youth who are unemployed in the African continent. And if this is done, then Africa will definitely not only win the 21st century, but ensure that it belongs to it. The last word, President Barack Obama said the deal would, quote, create jobs and economic growth driven by low carbon investment. Why? India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi declared, quote, climate justice has won and we are all working towards 
a greener future. Was there justice in Paris? Yes, indeed, there was justice in Paris. When you sit back and look into the future, knowing that the world have a huge responsibility of not only limiting emissions below two degrees, but even gearing towards the ambitious goal of 1.5, then it gives me and you and all the one billion African citizens and the seven billion world citizens that we could be able to do what we do and look into the future and say we can move forward, not only creating jobs for, for, for the millions of unemployed, but at the same time ensuring that we will not be living in flood plains as a result of rising sea levels because of climate change or in drought prone areas as a result of, 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 of uh, a changing climate that brings not only drought, but put so many people at the front line of disasters. All these together presents an opportunity. And I think it was not just justice done, but it was also an opportunity to show that the world collectively could agree on a very important and phenomenal issue like climate change. And I think this could be done for other important things like unemployment, which is ragging not only 60% of African youth, but at the same time r reducing the opportunities that Africa could tap into to leapfrog into a continent that will not only present opportunities to millions, but at the same time be also the best hope of humankind as, as, as we look forward to implementing Africa's Agenda 2063. Dr. Richard Munam from the United Nations Environment Program with headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya, I'm afraid we have to end here. Thank you very much indeed for being the first guest on Globe Watch 2016. Thank you very much, Charles, for giving me the opportunity. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you.